This content is not suitable for children, and listener discretion is advised. On Wednesday, February 24, 2010, a group of six form boys walk through Oldenham Country Park in Elstree, just outside the centre of Watford on their way to school. The gates opened early for dog walkers and runners, and with three schools near the park, kids walk through there all the time. The rain had been heavy that morning, but by 8.45am it had mostly cleared. The boys' route took them alongside a disused kiosk towards the entrance near the reservoir. Under the awning of the building, they saw someone lying on the ground. He stood out because he was wearing a bright yellow high-vis jacket. At first they assumed he was drunk and asleep, but when they saw he was face down, two of the boys walked over to see if he was okay. He wasn't. There was blood on the ground all around him. One of the boys ran for help, while the other phoned 999. While on the phone, the emergency operator asked him to roll the man over onto his back. He didn't want to. There was too much blood. So he shouted to another boy who was in the park to help him. The operator then asked him to put his ear close to the man's face to hear if he was breathing. He didn't know. He was panicking. When paramedics arrived, they found on the ground a burly man in a high-vis jacket, grey cargo trousers and black boots. He'd been severely beaten. Their attempts to revive him proved fruitless and he was pronounced dead at the scene. My name's Benjamin Fitton from They Walk Among Us. Welcome to Murder Town, the podcast. Following each episode of Crime and Investigation's brand new true crime TV series, we'll explore another case right here. When the Hertfordshire Constabulary arrived, the area was corned off and all entrances to the park were closed. Although there was a chance that this attack may have been carried out by someone on foot, they could not rule out a car had left the scene, especially seeing as there was a gate and car park right near the kiosk. With no wallet or mobile phone on the man, the assumption was that he had been attacked in the midst of a robbery. His clothing indicated he might have been a council worker and they would find out later that morning that they were right. 46-year-old Gary Bennett lived with his 80-year-old mother on the southern edge of Watford, five miles southeast of the park. He worked for the Watford Borough Council as a refuse collector and was due at the Wigan Hall Road waste depot earlier that morning, but unlike him, he never showed. After speaking to his mother, police established that he left work around 5am like he always did. The only difference was that his bike, which he usually rode to work, was still at home. Alice wondered whether someone might have given him a lift, but she couldn't work out why he would leave his rucksack that he used every day behind. The post-mortem showed that Gary had suffered pathologically severe injuries to his skull and brain, terminology used to describe extremely brutal and often excessive injuries. Thirteen blows to the back of the head were recorded, caused by an unknown heavy blunt instrument, likely made of metal, with some kind of edge to it, more than six centimetres in width. In addition, 19 locations of trauma were found on Gary's neck, back and shoulders. A fractured larynx and bruising across his neck signifies the use of a ligature. It was established that Gary was known to wear heavy gold chains. These were missing and thought to be the cause of the injury, possibly after having them removed from his neck with force. Whether this occurred before or after the blows to his head could not be determined, but the severity of the blows to his brain, plus the swelling that followed, was listed as the main contributor to his death. His hands and knuckles showed heavy bruising, a sign of having fought back against his attacker, blocking either the blunt object or hitting a hard surface. With Gary being a heavy-set man and over six feet tall, it was clear the assailants would have been a fair match for his size. The time of the attack was estimated as between 5am and 5.30am, half an hour after he left his house. It was described as a period of appalling and consistent anger and brutality by authorities, and the person who had inflicted such trauma they believed would have known, or at least assumed, Gary was dead. 
Forensic analysis of the scene showed blood distribution as well as spatter on a pillar at the kiosk, consistent with Gary's head being close to the ground, either being restrained or having already been incapacitated. According to the forensic scientist at the scene, Joanne Coogan, Gary's clothing, in particular his jacket, showed tears and damage consistent with an attack by either one implement with edges of differing sharpness or several implements. There was further blood spatter found low down on an adjacent wall of the kiosk, consistent with a person, likely the attacker, leaning against the wall while attacking Gary. The murderer would have to have walked away with some degree of blood on their clothing and possibly shoes. The following day, a press briefing was held where the public was asked to come forward with any information. Leading the investigation was Detective Superintendent Mick Hanlon of the Bedfordshire and Hertfordshire Major Crime Unit. He made it clear that police believed the murder was a targeted attack and they did not believe the public was in danger. Gary was missing his wallet, mobile phone, jewellery, and although they had not been able to establish why or how he came to be in the park, it was clear that he was likely driven there by someone known to him. The person had either arranged to drive him or known he would exit his house that morning and waited to offer him a lift. They asked for the community's assistance in piecing together what happened from the time Gary left his house at 5am to the discovery of his body five miles away. A team of police were pulling CCTV footage from all locations along the route, including the Bioproducts Laboratory across the road from the gated entrance on Dagger Road. Not only was this a way to ensure the public that they were doing everything they could to catch the killer, but they used it as an opportunity to send a message to the killer that they were closing in. Gary Bennett had lived with his mum Alice in Little Oxy Lane in Watford since he was two years old, and for 44 years that place was the only home he ever knew. His father had died 10 years earlier, and Gary had been a tremendous support and comfort to her. They spent a lot of time together, with Gary taking her out on day trips all the time, often saying things to her like, OK then, let's go to Brighton today. As a teenager, Gary worked part-time, and since he finished school, he had worked hard at a few different full-time jobs before starting at the Waste Depot. Alice described him as the most loving and generous man. He made sure she had everything she needed and was always hugging her, laughing and joking around. Gary loved being with his family and was close to his older brother and sister with whom he had already organised a family holiday with for later that year. Living in Watford suited Gary, who enjoyed routine and his simple, unassuming life. The 43 public parks and gardens and Watford's Grand Union Canal create a peaceful country air for a town only 15 miles from London. His workmates said the same thing. He was a gentle and unassuming guy and well-liked. He got along with everyone, was a keen punter and loved playing the lottery. When Gary wasn't having a bet, he enjoyed simple things at home with his mum. No one who knew him could reconcile what had happened. Gary had no enemies, he had not had any recent disagreements with anyone, and was not known to police. He was what everyone called a friendly, gentle giant. Each morning at around 4.30am, his mum Alice would go into his room and give him a nudge to get him up for his shift as a bin man for the local council, a job he had worked at for over 10 years. Images were released to the public taken from CCTV footage of a local Ladbrokes betting shop the day before Gary died. He could be seen placing a bet in his work gear, the same high-vis and black beanie he would have been wearing the day of the murder. In the background, his bike could be seen leaning up against the shop wall. They hoped someone might recognise him and call in. The investigation focused on Gary's work, interviewing everyone who had worked with or spent time with him in recent months, and they worked on finding out who might have given him a lift that day. If someone gave him a lift, then surely they were from his work. And with the park not even on the route from Gary's house to work, establishing a reason for him to be there was proving difficult. By this time, nine days had passed, and police went back to the Watford community over the next few days with information that they believed might hold the key to what had happened to Gary and who was responsible. 
it had been established that Gary's gold necklace was worth up to around £3,000 and he may have been wearing two. Also, he was likely carrying around £500 in cash in his brown leather wallet, which was missing. Gary was known to carry a lot of cash, mostly from his wins down at Ladbrokes. Police announced at another press conference they wished to speak with anyone who had been offered or sold on a heavy gold chain or heard anyone say that they had acquired one or seen one in a pawn shop. A sketch was released of a man who had been seen leaving the park gate near the kiosk at around 5.45am that morning. This man was wearing a high-vis jacket and was described by the witness as not resembling Gary. Two further witnesses had come forward. They had seen two men wearing high-vis jackets enter the park at the same gate a little earlier. The police believe this was the 15-minute window in which Gary was killed. By this time, the police were announcing to the public a description of the type of person they believed the killer was. He was most likely a person known to Gary. He may have got up for work around 5am and was possibly late for work on the Wednesday Gary was killed. He wore a high visibility jacket, likely for his job, and may have been acting suspiciously that day. He may have asked at his place of work that day for a replacement high-vis jacket because his may have had blood on it. Detectives had been talking to everyone at the depot where Gary worked. They had questioned everyone about the type of boots and clothing they wore to work and even the type of clothing they wore the day of the murder. Some were questioned multiple times. What no one at the depot knew was that the CCTV footage had shown that someone dressed almost identically to Gary was seen entering the park within that morning, so police were scrutinising everyone. A few workers spoke of Gary selling pouches of tobacco. One had been buying off him for years. He didn't know where Gary had obtained the tobacco, but it had been a regular thing until recently when his source dried up. Two days before Gary's murder, he was expecting a delivery, and this workmate said he would buy five pouches when it came in. To police, selling tobacco didn't seem reason enough to suspect this had anything to do with Gary's death, but they did need to look into who he purchased his supply from, because this might be someone he was in regular contact with. Another worker at the depot, Julian Felici, also drove the bin lorries, and like many others, had already been questioned but officers needed to clarify a few things. According to him, Gary wouldn't hurt a fly, and he couldn't see any reason why anyone would want to kill him. He said he'd only worked with him a handful of times and affectionately called him Gary Pork Pie, the name he had listed him as in his phone. He had his number because for four years he had been selling him tobacco. Every few months, Julian Felici would purchase about 80 pouches of tobacco when he travelled to Europe. Upon his return, he would sell 30, maybe 40 pouches to Gary, who would then sell them on. He explained it wasn't to make money, it just covered the cost of his own tobacco. The detectives asked if they could take Felici's boots. When he was first questioned at his home, they had mentioned they would need to make a mould of the tread but when the officers realised they didn't have their kit that day, they left them. Now they were coming to collect them. Felici explained that a few days after they had made the first visit, his boots split and he threw them away. He thought if the detectives believed they were that important, they would have already taken them. Police had seen the CCTV footage from the bioproducts lab across the road from the park, a place you would have to drive right by if you were parking near the kiosk. One of the cameras picked something up. Although very grainy, two patches of light were seen moving in the direction of the gate by the kiosk at 5.31am. These appeared to be high-vis jackets catching the light. They conducted a reenactment with two men and were able to produce the same imagery. What the CCTV had picked up were the two men walking through the gate in high-vis jackets, just like the witnesses had stated, and 15 minutes later, only one exited. More cameras at the Bioproducts Lab were scoured. At 5.03am, a Skoda Octavia was captured driving towards the park. The only distinguishing feature was that the car was missing a rear hubcap. Six minutes later, the same car could be seen driving away from the park, back past the Bioproducts Lab. 
17 minutes after this, the car comes back again, pulling over a few hundred yards from the park's gate. From this point, detectives went back to the first footage where they captured the two figures entering the gate. They walked out of view, and 15 minutes later, only one man returned. There was one person known to Gary who drove a Skoda Octavia. The man he worked with who sold him the tobacco, Julian Felici. Police were sure they had their man, but they needed evidence. First, they needed to prove it was Felice's Skoda captured in the images. When they found his Skoda was missing a rear hubcap, they knew Felice had lied to them. They then had to prove the timing. Usually at 5.47am, the exact time the Skoda was seen leaving the park, Felice should already be clocked in at work. The CCTV footage of the depot was pulled. Julian Felice, late for work, had driven his Skoda through the gates of the Wigan Hall Road Waste Depot at 6.04am, wearing his high-vis jacket. It was then found that Felice had, in that time, phoned the driver of his lorry to say he would be a few minutes late that morning. Various cameras followed his movements after his car was parked. No longer wearing his jacket when he was captured walking towards the toilets, it appeared he had left it in the car. He remained in the bathroom for a minute and a half before heading to the main office to sign in. He then walks back to his car. This time, he has a new high-vis t-shirt on and could be seen going to the boot of his car and moving stuff around. Nearing ten minutes late, Felici climbed into the driver's cabin of his lorry, telling his driver that he didn't have his high-vis jacket. He reached into the cabin's cupboard and pulled out a spare commenting that the size 5XL must have been Gary's because it was so big. The last time detectives had interviewed Julian Felici, he had spoken of Gary in passing as an acquaintance, a guy he had a tobacco arrangement with. It said he had no idea what had happened to Gary that morning. Three weeks after the murder, police had enough evidence to arrest him for suspicion of murder. Knowing that he would be rising early for work, police raided his Watford home he shared with his girlfriend at 4.45am on the 16th of March. He was placed under arrest and over the following three hours of interviews, every answer, his reply remained the same. No comment. Up to this point he had stuck to his story that he had not seen Gary that morning and had nothing to do with his murder. Then they confronted him with all the CCTV footage they had pieced together Suddenly, his story changed. He was now saying he had seen Gary that morning, but he swore it wasn't what they thought. Here is what Julian Felici then told police had happened. On the morning of the murder, Gary had asked Felici for a lift before work to meet two Irishmen for a tobacco deal. Felici collected Gary from his house at 4.45am. According to Felici, Gary got in the car and instructed him to drive to a railway bridge to meet the men, but before they left his road, two men stepped out from near a white van. According to this version of events, one of the Irishmen who in his story just happened to be wearing a high-vis jacket put something in the boot of Felice's Skoda. This was the point where Felice began painting the picture of another person wearing high-vis clothing a way of pretending that the man seen in the CCTV footage was not him. The following is taken from Julian Felice's future testimony. I was directed towards Oldenham Country Park and then down a lane on Oldenham Road. It was dark, but I had my window down and I could hear sails flapping, so I knew we were near the park. One of the men got out and the other told me to drive around for a bit, so I did. Apparently, when he drove back to the park, the Irishman in the car told him to pull over. At that point, the man exited the car with Gary and disappeared into the park, presumably to meet up with the other Irishman. Felici then said he stayed at the car and smoked a cigarette in the rain. He could hear shouting coming from the park, so he thought he should see what was going on. He claimed he could not have been in any footage going through the gate at that point because he was not wearing a high-vis jacket. The following, again, is taken from Felice's testimony. I could see figures in the distance by the kiosk. I ran over to them, and I could see two men standing and one person on the floor. 
By his size and stature, I assumed it was Gary. I bent down, and I could not see his face, so I turned his head towards me, and I could see it was Gary. I couldn't see blood, but his head felt wet, which I assumed was blood. One of the men came towards me, and I pushed him away, but the other grabbed me, took me towards Dagger Lane. He was the one with the high visibility jacket. At this point, Felici claimed that one of the Irishmen ran off in the other direction, while the one in the high-vis jacket walked him back to his car, threatening him with a knife. His story to police about being in dark clothing was his way of saying it was not him seen in the footage. The Irishman went to his boot again and rummaged around, before forcing him to drive him to a bus stop for him to flee to London. According to Felici, he did not wish to ask any questions. The man had a knife and he was scared. He still was. He had not told them of this before because he felt fearful for his girlfriend and his children's safety. He claimed he had not given this information over until he was sure his family was safe. Police were not buying his story. They didn't believe his convenient series of events which seemed to point to two Irishmen parking Gary Street. One, conveniently wearing a high-vis jacket, exactly as Felici would typically wear. They murdered Gary over a tobacco deal, all while Felici waited by the car, bearing witness to the murder and not doing anything. Why, when he knew Gary was dying on the ground or worse, possibly dead, did he not ask him if he was all right, or ask the Irishman what had happened? He was bombarded with questions over why he didn't call an ambulance, why he had dropped the Irishman off at a bus stop when the man's car was parked in Gary Street, about the call way Felicia had phoned into work, saying he would be a few minutes late, and then going about his shift like nothing ever happened. None of this was being ignored by any of the police. Felici argued he was in a state of shock. He had an answer for everything. When confronted with the CCTV footage of him arriving in his car to work, where he could be seen driving while wearing a high-vis vest, he just said he must have put it back on sometime after dropping the man off at the bus stop. Felici claimed he had continued to receive written death threats from the two Irishmen in the weeks after the murder. He had thrown the notes away for fear of being implicated in the killing. DNA testing of the Skoda revealed traces of Gary's blood on a rucksack and a plastic bag both owned by Felici in the boot. The bloodstains were consistent with someone's blood-stained hands coming into contact with the rucksack. His act was over. The charges were laid. The trial was held at St Albans Crown Court with Julian Felici entering a plea of not guilty. It was scheduled to run for two weeks, but because of the enormous amount of evidence, it stretched to four. The prosecution told the jury that they should not be concerned that there was a lack of motive in the murder. The evidence was clear. Julian Felici had lured Gary Bennett to the park that morning, possibly under the premise of a tobacco deal, maybe to rob him, beat him, and ultimately kill him. Why? They did not know. Felici had lied when questioned, and then when formally interviewed after his arrest, he remained completely silent, except for uttering the words, no comment. He only began to tell his convoluted tale of Irish underworld figures and swapping high-vis jackets when faced with overwhelming evidence against him, when he saw with his own eyes the footage the police had pieced together. Barrister Mr. Speak said, Even if we accept for a split second, and we don't, that he was not able to phone the emergency services, why did he not call his friend who he knew was lying injured in the park just five or six minutes drive away? The reality, shocking though it is, is that Mr. Felici, in a period of appalling and consistent anger and brutality, smashed in Gary Bennett's head in that kiosk and murdered him inflicting such appalling injuries to his head and brain that he knew when he left him, he was dead. As the trial drew to a close, the judge informed the jury that they must consider, after hearing all the evidence, whether or not they think the defendant is guilty, regardless of whether or not a reason for him committing the crime becomes apparent. The jury's verdict, after 14 hours of deliberation, was unanimous. Julian Felici was guilty of the murder of Gary Bennett, 
and sentenced to 22 years in prison. When addressing Felici, the judge, Jude Stephen Gullick, said, Why you killed Gary Bennett, only you know. You lured him to that location and you took with you such weapon or implement as to inflict those injuries. He was a work colleague of yours, and the circumstances of his death were ones of furious violence by blows to the back of his head by a weapon that has never been recovered. Only you know where it is. There are factors I must take into my judgment, including the viciousness and brutality of the attack in delivering blow after blow. After the conviction, Gary's family began picking up the pieces, trying to move on and make sense of how and why this event even happened. They went on to take their family holiday without him, his death leaving a gaping hole in all their lives. His former colleagues held a vigil where they tied black ribbons to his lorry and family and friends held a disco in his memory, raising £1,350 for the Alzheimer's Society. Alice's mum said, a year after the trial, you have got to go on living, but my life can never be the same. Even now, you think of the time you used to come in from work. You look at the clock and it reminds you. We miss everything about him. We can't let go. I'm Catherine Kelly, host of Crime and Investigation's brand new true crime TV series, Murder Town. Join me next Monday at 9pm for a visit to Huddersfield, known for its charming canals and hidden country walks, but also the town where five dead bodies were found in a month. For more information on the series, head to crimeandinvestigation.co.uk and let us know your thoughts by searching for Crime and Investigation on social media or using hashtag MurderTown. The Murder Town podcast is hosted by Benjamin Fitton, written by Anna Priestland, produced by Sam Pearson and Chloe Frost, with editing by James Colopy.